Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. In this video, I want to introduce to you the various parts of the central nervous system. So to begin with, you need to understand that the central nervous system is made up of the brain and the spinal cord. And it's central anatomically because it sits in the middle of the body, but it's also central functionally because it's the site of information integration. It's where we make sense of all the signals that are coming into us from the environment, whether that's the external or internal environment. We make an, a decision, we understand what's going on, and then we send a signal out to the various muscles, tissues, or glands of the body in order to have some sort of reaction to those stimuli that are coming in. Now, if we look at the brain itself, first thing I wanna begin with is the fact that the brain sits within a skull casing, that bony structure that we call the skull. But above the brain, but below the skull, there's actually three protective layers on, of the brain that we term the meninges or meningeal layers. So these three layers, if I were to draw them up for you very quickly, the first layer is the layer that's most adherent to the brain itself. And this layer is termed the pia mater. And pia means soft, mater means mother. It's the soft mother. Basically, it's like tissue paper that's stuck to the brain itself. On top of the pia mater, we've got another layer that has these projections down to the pia mater that look a little bit like a spider's web. And this is called the arachnoid mater, or spider mother. Interestingly, below the arachnoid layer, but above the pia mater, is where the cerebral spinal fluid floats through. Now on top of the arachnoid mater, we've got a very tough layer called the dura mater which means tough mother. And it's like a paper bag consistency, very tough. On top of the dura mater is where we have our skull. And again, cumulatively, these three layers are called our meninges or meningeal layers. And if they have some sort of infection or inflammation associated with them, that's called meningitis. So let's take the brain, move it down, have a look at the various parts of the brain. First, We've got the actual brain itself that we call the cerebrum, which is made up of multiple lobes. So we've got the cerebrum here. Then we've got the little cerebrum, which we term the cerebellum. And cerebellum actually does mean little cerebrum. And then we've got the brain stem. And obviously below the brain stem, that's where we've got the spinal cord. So the brain stem. First thing I wanna look at is the cerebrum. So remember, if you were to cut into the brain itself and have a look, you'd find that some aspects we call gray matter, some aspects we call white matter. Why is that? What is the difference? Well, if I were to draw a neuron up, a very basic neuron with a cell body, an axon, and the axon terminal. And so, for example, this neuron may be speaking to another neuron, right? Now, what you find is that these cell bodies, when you have a collection of these neuron cell bodies, they make up the gray matter. And the axons actually make up the white matter. Now, why is this the case? It's because the axons, all they do is send information. They need to send information really quickly. So they're surrounded by insulation, which is fat. And fat looks white. And that's why the axons are white matter and the cell bodies relative to the axons are gray matter. The other important point is that wherever you find gray matter, it means there's obviously a lot of cell bodies. This is where information is being made sense of. This is the site of integration. This is where all the thought and behavior and processes occur. The axons or the white matter, they're just highways. That's all they are, sending information back and forth. Now both the brain and the spinal cord have gray and white matter associated with them. 
Now, if we look at the cerebrum, it's broken up into various lobes or cortices. Now, the cortex is simply the few millimeters of the outside of the cerebrum made up of gray matter. So it's the place where we make sense of stuff and we become consciously aware. And we can break these cortices or lobes up into what we've got as the frontal lobe, We've got the frontal lobe, we've got the temporal lobe, we've got the parietal lobe, and we've got the occipital lobe. And what you'll find is that the bones of the skull that overlay them have the same particular names. So what do these particular lobes do? Well, they all play very important roles and functions within the body, and there's a lot of overlap in those functions, but some important roles that we can designate to particular areas include the following. So the frontal lobe is the site of the motor cortex. Motor cortex. Now what that means is, this is the area in which if you want to consciously initiate movement, so to talk, to move, to run, jump, sing, dance, whatever it may be, it must begin at the motor cortex which is located at the frontal lobe. The parietal lobe is the location of what we call the somatosensory cortex. And the somato, so somato means body, sensory is picking up sensation. So anytime you become consciously aware of sensation, where it be touch, pressure, pain, whatever it may be, it must go to the parietal lobe in order for you to understand it and make sense of it. The occipital lobe is where we have the visual cortex. Again, anytime you see something, in order for you to understand it and be aware of it, it must go to the occipital lobe. And the temporal lobe, is the site of the auditory cortex. This is where we understand and make sense of sound. Now there's obviously other various roles, but this is a very quick intro to some of the important roles of the various lobes. Now let's go to the cerebellum, the small brain or the small cerebrum. Three important roles here that you should be aware of. First of which is it plays a role in maintaining tone and posture and balance. They're the three important roles you should be aware of. What this means is an example I like to use is if somebody said, can you help me move house? Sure, help me move those boxes. That's a heavy box, be careful Mike. Make sure you bend with your knees, not with your back and you get down, you tense those muscles up, ready to pick it up and then you realize it's an empty box and they pointed at the wrong box. Now what's stopping you from flipping backwards because you're prepared to pick up something very heavy? It's the cerebellum. It receives input coming in from your muscles and where you are in your own space and how bent or flexed the particular joint is and it fine tunes it. And so it fine tunes that tone, so how contracted a muscle is, your posture and your balance. That's the important roles of the cerebellum. Now what about the brainstem? Well the brainstem is made up of three parts. We've got the first part here sitting immediately underneath the cerebrum, second part here and third part here. Underneath that third part that's where we've got the spinal cord. So what are these three parts? Well the first part is what we call the midbrain. Second part is what we call the pons. And the third part is what we call the medulla oblongata, also just known as the medulla. Now what does the brainstem do? Well, firstly, it is the house of most of what we call the cranial nerves. These are the nerves that play important roles in the head and neck. So basically being able to touch, being able to see, being able to talk and move and all those particular functions of the head and neck, their cell bodies, most of them are located in that brain stem. But the brain stem is important for a number of other reasons. For example, it's extremely important when it comes to respiratory and cardiovascular rhythms. 
So that's breathing rhythms and heart rate, really important here at the brainstem. And the brainstem is extremely important when it comes to various types of reflexes. So remember, reflexes bypass our conscious understanding and it's reflexive and it's usually there to protect us. So some of the important reflexes at the brainstem include the blink reflex. So if something were to touch your eye and you were to close your eyes reflexively, uh, it is if you see a particular shape or sound or something happening in your periphery and your eyes dart to that position, that reflex is happening at the brainstem. It's also the cough reflex, the vomiting reflex, the jaw jerk reflex, for example. So a number of really important reflexes. That's the brainstem. All right, now I want to move over to the spinal cord. And when we have a look at the spinal cord, it's going to be separated into various divisions or regions. Now, the spinal cord has axons or neurons that shoot out and away and back into it and various areas. So for example, you've got the cervical, you've got the thoracic, the lumbar, the sacral, and the coccygeal. These are the various regions of our spinal cord, and there's neurons that shoot out and away and back in. From the cervical, which just means neck or cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, coccygeal, and they've got peripheral nerves associated with them, and there's actually 31 pairs of peripheral nerves that sit throughout the spinal cord. Now the spinal cord also plays an important role for reflexes as well. Now a reflex, like I said, it bypasses going to the conscious area, so the cortices of the brain. And it can be something where I touch a hot plate and my arm reflexively moves back, for example. Or if I'm walking and I step on some glass, it allows for that leg to move back and for the other leg to plant. So these reflexes actually occur at the spinal cord itself. So what we've done is a quick run through introduction to the various parts and functions of the central nervous system.